So I'm going to present um, a few of the current projects that I'm working on. And as introduced, I work as an artist, um, as, but I straddle the fields of hardware design, engineering, robotics, and a lot of my work has to do with electronics. Yeah, is that better? All right, cool. Um, a lot of the work that I do has to do with robotics, electronics, but I do a lot of physical fabrication, um, as well as some data-driven projections and installations in public spaces that I'll also talk about. Um, so this is Neil. And this is the first project I'm going to talk about. And Neil is a biomimetic robotic snake. And it's been an ongoing series of work that I've been doing with this project. And thus far, I've been built about eight in the series. And by biomimetic robotic snake, I mean that it's a ro robot that has the form, of, a form and function of a real snake. Um, I, I began the project in about 2011, and it was an attempt to develop an open source platform for data collection. But it was also as an exploration of how algorithms through software propagate different types of motion. So really when engaging with the question of why build a robot snake, um, a huge part of my in inspiration stems from my background as a classical pianist. And throughout the, my beginning, my early childhood, even starting at age four, um, I had a very technical piano professor and her name was Mrs. Grad, and I remember her really drilling into um, a, a lot of my work that the mathematical patterns in nature really were repetitive, like the Fibonacci series and the golden ratio. And I have these distinct memories of holding these seashells in my hand during my piano lessons and having her tell me how that should translate into the type of motion that I use while playing the piano. But snakes, to me, also exhibit this really sort of epitome of this beautiful oscillating motion. And this is a rattlesnake I encountered in Florida a few years ago. But um, I've had a long obsession with snakes and reptiles in general. And really during a transformational age, um, like 12, I started to get a lot of pets, a lot of pet snakes. And so these are some of them. Um, so I started my career after college as a biologist, and for a while I did research in the desert in Arizona, and I was looking at snakes and rattlesnakes and their migration patterns, and these are some of the ones I worked with. And then in 2008, I transitioned from a field of biology into art and hardware. And uh, snake motion and sort of the mathematics behind the motion um, really started to manifest themselves in this project, Sneal, that I've been working on. Um, and it really stems from a deep fascination both with the biological form of the snake as well as creating sculptural kinetic objects. So I want to reference just a few of the, uh, the frameworks that, the conceptual frameworks that drive my work. And the first concept is biomimicry, which means mimicking form and function from biology in uh, an engineering or an art design. So one example that I like to cite that's really been inspirational is Philip Beasley's work. Um, Philip Beasley is an architect and an artist, and one work called the Epiphyte Chamber, it references an epiphyte, which is a plant that grows not in the soil, but it could actually grow without the roots in the soil, but on the trees. So um, this, he makes these plants, these whole rooms full of these plant-like creatures that are actually small robotic uh, creatures that respond to uh, touch or motion. So he really uh, engages with the relationship that people have to these robots um, and creatures. So my work also engages with this interconnectedness of animals and humans and in our natural ecosystems, how that shapes our perception. So Natalie Jeremijenko is a, um, a New York-based artist, and one project that I often reference is called Ooze, which um, she had a series, it was basically like robots that were in a, what a typical zoo would be like, except there were these specific uh, regiments that people would have to go through in order to interact with these, 
these uh, robotic animals. So it really challenged people and questioned our role within the complex ecosystem in which we live. The last concept I'm very much engaged with in my uh, art practice is modularity. And basically, what does it mean to use small modular components but form something larger that's reconfigurable and can self-assemble? So a project that I'm very much I interested and obsessed with is called Cubelets, and it's an open source hardware project that allows you to put together these different cubes. Some are action cubes, some are sensory cubes, and some are thinking cubes. So you can really form these complex tasks with different types of components. So my work on SNEEL has taken an iterative process building upon code and hardware and different types of fabrication methods in a really collaborative way. And its original form mimicked that from an open source hardware project that I've been working on and I'm still very much involved in. It started in 2010 and it's called Prote. And Prote is a shape-shifting sailing robot that's open source, and it's designed to tow an oil absorbent boom behind it to sustainably clean up water, uh, oil off uh, the water, and it was inspired by the BP oil spill as a response to have an open source way to enable local communities to take a hands-on approach to oil spill cleanup. But now Prote acts as a modular platform to carry all types of data sensors and to look for things like radioactivity off the coast or plastic trash in the water or oil on the water. But the entire body actually flexes like a snake to control the trajectory in the water. So now Prote's finally this month available to be bought and, and we're, we're shipping it from the headquarters in China, which is now where the headquarters are. And it can be bought, the, the site that we're, we developed to ship it is called scoutbots.com um, and you could buy it as either a prefabricated boat or as a kit. And it's, this is like uh, basically just this week that it's going into production. So it's sort of, yeah, exciting time, but also to try to, a, a time when people who are going to get it and it's not going to work, but people are going to help us hack through the stuff that doesn't work and um, it'll be exciting to see what happens. But a lot of the work that we've done has been leading hackathons and going all over the world, leading workshops and in places like Europe, China, Brazil, Morocco, and building and deploying these DIY robots. And what we've used it for last year was to measure radioactivity off the coast of Fukushima and try to, we're, we're working now with um, people who are using different types of robotic boats to measure plastic trash in the Pacific Ocean. We're working on our own data aggregation system, but we're also using safe casts. Um, we're, we're using pre-existing data, databases. Um, SafeCast is one example of a company that is developing open source Geiger counters, but enabling people to just take an SD card, plug it in, and measure radioactivity. And they're based in Tokyo, but also trying to do this throughout the world. So in 2011, I got really interested in building a derivative of Prote that was a platform for a swimming robot that could swim autonomously on the water, but it could get to places that humans couldn't go. And I started hacking away to try to build a robotic snake that could eventually build, be this long-term platform for research on Mars, or uh, search and rescue, or firefighting, or exploring pipelines like this one. And the, the process that I started to take, I really wanted to get a robot that was more derived from a snake. Um, and so I studied a real snake and looked at a lot of videos, looked at a lot of algorithms, and used that as a starting point. So the mechanical fabrication is based on the spine of a real snake. So each vertebrate snaps together. The brain, which is on the left, which is Arduino, this is a current prototype that I've been building. Um, it sends a signal down the spine, like a, like a spinal column. And the spinal column run, runs down the back, the bottom of the snake, and transmits a signal to each vertebrae. 
so I've looked a lot at swimming patterns of snakes and studied the motion algorithms of real snakes in order to get, um, to try to optimize swimming behavior. And I started prototyping uh, SNEEL version 1 based on my experience building the sailing robots, but I wanted individual controls over the joints. So I started with laser cut plexiglass that fit servo motors. And I tried to fit them together with magnets and other ways. But then I built SNEEL version 2, which was the first one that was able to actually move on its own in an organic way. I spent a lot more time working on the software for SNEEL 2, and I started prototyping software algorithm, algorithms using motion, uh, the dots that could represent motors, and this is using processing. And I also tried to actually see what, what would little motors look like if they're moving and stagnant. And I wrote a software library that could easily generate um, different types of locomotion based on oscillation by modifying the wavelength, the period, and the amplitude at each node to modify the swimming behavior. <laughs> going to clean up all the oil. Two, finally swimming two years ago in Central Park. Water, so So then I built Sneal version three um, a couple summers ago at, or yeah, a couple summers ago at Instructables before they had the new space on Pier 9, which is this. And I, it swam faster because I changed the algorithm a little bit. Um, I, I put a water pump on it and then I put it in Golden Gate Park. So both for SNEEL version 2 and 3, I'd been using these expensive titanium brackets and as well as carbon fiber to connect the brackets. But I, I love the formal quality of this, but my goal now is really to optimize the time and the cost because it took a lot of time to assemble as well as uh, it was quite expensive. So this is more of what the new prototypes look like and I'm trying to optimize the prototyping methods to, to be able to 3D print joints, snap them together so they're more modular, and eventually have them be like Legos that might even be able to come and be totally modular to snap together on their own. So part of my reason for wanting to be easy and cheap is because I have these dreams of these swarms of robotic snakes that are roaming the world and interacting with people and sort of these friendly personal robots. Um, to achieve this, I, I make all my work open and available for everybody to use, modify, and distribute. So it's an open hardware project, which means that I document all of my work online, as well as my designs on places like GitHub, on my own site, as well as Instructables. Um, and for SNEELs 1, 2, and 3, I've already documented the work on Instructables, and it's been more and more of a community of people contributing in the forums as well as building their own, and it's, it's been uh, definitely inspiring. Um, on the note of open source hardware, I'm the, currently acting as the president of OSHWA, which is the Open Source Hardware Association. So um, it's, it's an organization for promoting open source hardware and educating the community about it. So open access and modularity are very important concepts driving my work. So to end on SNEEL, um, it's really an exploration for me but, and, but it really shows the, this tension that I have in my work that's um, looking at both a functional robot that can perform tasks like data collection, but also uh, looking at how a sculptural object might be formed that could be propagated by different types of algorithms in hardware. But in addition to robotics and hardware, I also design physical installations and um, 
using new and emerging technologies. And they're often collaborative. And this is a studio that a few of my friends and I moved into after graduating from grad school in New York a couple years ago from ITP. And we co-founded this studio collective and company called Floating Point. And now some of the members are out here working on a current installation in San Francisco. Um, and we're a collection of artists, designers, coders, and we're just trying to use technology as this medium for expression. So one of Floating Point's recent uh, projects is being done right here in San Francisco on Pier 27, which is a new pier that's being built. And we're working based out of Autodesk's Instructables facilities on Pier 9. And we're developing a public art commission. Um, it's it's uh, on Pier 27 where cruise ships will be entering the port and leaving the port. Um, so people will be walking on and off and getting into this indoor area. That it's, so the installation is a two-story permanent multimedia interactive sculpture in a passageway where people will be entering the, um, the ticketing area before going upstairs and getting their tickets to get on the ship. So what it is, it's a sculpture that's a wavy stainless steel sculpture that's gonna have these interactive, pa these natural patterns of light um, moving across. Um, we'll use 3D sensing cameras to detect people's presence so that they'll be able to interact with the piece and the ambient light forms will react to the people. And it's an ins this installation is a memorial for one of the union workers who, um, named Jimmy Herman. And he was a, the former president of the Longshoremen's Union in San Francisco, as well as an avid social rights activist. And there's also going to be a touch screen that gives more of a story about Jimmy's life, as well as the ILWU union history, which is integral to San Francisco city history. Um, and the content is inspired by Jimmy's advocacy for social rights and workers' rights. And Jack Kalish and Genevieve Hoffman are also spear they're spearheading the project, and they're here today. So if you want to know more about it, you should talk to them. Um, this is another one of Floating Point's installations called Landscapes. And Landscapes was first installed in, the, in spring of 2012 in, at NYC, in Internet Week NYC, which is an internet trade show. But thus, since then, it's been installed in different iterations in different galleries and public spaces. The concept started out as a way to embody the internet by creating a physical space where people could interact to build sculptures. And over time, they could, their presence would, would affect the space itself in this virtual world that was projected. Landscapes uses 3D cameras overhead and software that's written in open frameworks, and it allows visitors um, to collaboratively build up these structures that are in the form of the projection. So people could actually either passively pass through or uh, engage with actually building or destroying the various forms. But then over the course of the installation, as people sculpt these forms, what we've been uh, taking snapshots of the of landscapes as um, as the architecture morphs over time. So we save the three D the the three D file as an STL or something else, and then from that data we three D print these data driven sculptures of various forms. And so this completes the circle of translating physical gesture into virtual data and then back into a physical sculpture. So each sculpture is one of a kind, representing a specific location in time and space, as well as uh, the sculptural translation of data. And currently, it's up in New York, um, and it will be in LA at the end of June. So in conclusion, both my installation work as well as uh, my physical robotic work really tries, it, it's an attempt to um, use software and hardware as a medium to create work that inspires play and really looks at algorithms that engage people and myself in different ways. Um, 
So thank you very much. I look forward to talking after, and I have a SNEAL prototype if people want to see it and play with it afterwards. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.